Good day and welcome to today's webinar, Jumpstarting EU Data Privacy Compliance with Data Classification, including the new Privacy Shield. With me today is Scott Giordano. Scott is a data privacy lawyer with several decades of experience specializing in multinational and cross-border aspects of data protection. Scott was also the creator and teacher of the first law course on electronic device and e-discovery. I'm Gabriel Gums, the Vice President of Product Strategy at at Spirian, and I have been in the information security business myself for roughly uh, 15, 16 years at this point. I started as an ethical hacker and spent much of my time building security programs for large organizations throughout the U.S. Scott. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you for having me on the call, in fact. Um, to everyone that's attending our call, um, if you leave this presentation with nothing else, I ask that you leave with this. Um, the, the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, is the most sweeping privacy legislation to be enacted in the last 20 years or so. And if you're not already working on getting involved in compliance and coming into compliance, I believe that you will be soon. Secondly, getting Privacy Shield certified before the end of September is entirely possible, even if you start today and it offers a nine-month grace period in order to fix any shortcomings that you might have with your third-party data processing contracts. And finally, data discovery and classification is likely the most cost-effective tool for promoting information security and data privacy that is available right now. So with that, let me talk a little bit about the, the EU GDPR and why you might care. Um, the first of all is that this is a comprehensive approach to data protection. So in the U.S., we use a what's called sectoral approach, meaning that different sectors get different privacy and security regulations. So there's those for healthcare, there are those for financial data, there are those for the government, and so on and so forth. The uh, EU approach is just the opposite. Essentially, everyone has to adhere to the same set of privacy and security standards. Secondly, the GDPR is not, repeat, is not privacy shield. Privacy Shield is what's called a data transfer mechanism. So it's a mechanism for transferring the personal data of EU residents over to the U.S. That's it. The General Data Protection Regulation, on the other hand, addresses just about every single aspect you could possibly think of data security and privacy for companies that are operating in the EU or are marketing or selling goods and services into the EU. So really, they, they are somewhat related, but they are different creatures entirely. Really, the default answer in the EU is no. This is a, a, a direct contrast to how we do things here in the U.S., where if you wish to process personal data, generally speaking, you've got wide latitude to do so. The reverse is true in the EU. You cannot process personal data unless there is uh, one of, of at least six categories that uh, you have checked the box in, essentially. So think about if you were involved in an e-commerce agreement, perhaps you bought something on Amazon or some other e-commerce site in the EU, uh, they would necessarily need your personal data to process the transaction. So that's something that you would be giving your implicit consent to. Uh, it may be that you gave explicit consent. It may be that there's a legitimate interest for the uh, company involved to process that personal data, but there has to be some basis for processing and for transferring to the U.S. personal data, otherwise the default answer is no. Thirdly, the GDPR is a regulation, uh, not a directive, and that's an important distinction. It, there's really no equivalent here in the U.S. Uh, a directive literally directs a company, I'm sorry, directs a country to develop a certain uh, set of laws according to the directive's principles. And this is what we are working with right now. It's called the EU Data Protection Directive. That's enforced, been enforced since about 1995. The regulation is different. As it is passed, it is to be enforced exactly as written. So there's no need to what's called transpose the uh, directive into national laws. It's simply it's enforced consistently among the 28 EU member nations. In terms of penalties for violations of the GDPR, you'll find a big difference. Right now, you could get anywhere from 150,000 euros to 900,000 euros of a penalty if you violate EU data protection regulations, or I'm sorry, the directive. However, for the, the regulation itself, 
The fines can be the higher of 20 million euros or 4% of your company's gross, uh, uh, gross worldwide revenues. So it's a substantially higher number, and uh, it really makes a big difference in how you, uh, how you approach data protection in the EU. Most companies will need the entire two years. The, uh, the regulation was passed in May of this year. It will be in force in May of 2018, and those two years are going to occupy the time of a lot of, uh, a lot of companies, simply because there's so much work to do. Let's talk about Privacy Shield itself, which is Safe Harbor's replacement. Uh, Safe Harbor involved transferring EU personal data to the U.S. That's it. Um, the best way to think about it is that the U.S. data controllers um, uh, needed to get around this whole issue that our data protection regimes here in the U.S. were not adequate for the European Union. And I use the word adequate in air quotes. Um, that's per Article 25, Sub 6 of the Data Protection Directive. Said another way, Safe Harbor was negotiated with the European Commission to address what would have been a big problem in the processing of EU personal data by U.S. companies, U.S. data controllers. Secondly, uh, Safe Harbor was invalidated in October of 2015, and the case involved is called Max Trans versus Data Protection Commissioner. So a large factor in this decision was the U.S. government's bulk collection of personal data. And I'm sure everyone on the call here is familiar with the Edward Snowden matter. Um, after that decision, privacy professionals like myself spent a lot of time getting data transfer agreements executed to legitimize those data transfers. The standards of, of Privacy Shield, I, would be, um, I, I suspect you would all consider them to be somewhat elevated. And I use the word elevated because if you place the standards for Safe Harbor along those with Privacy Shield, you'll find that while they are similar, um, Privacy Shield elevates them, uh, increases them, if you will, in certain places. And we'll compare the new with the old, at least with respect to security, in just a couple minutes. Enforcement of the Privacy Shield, no different than enforcement of Safe Harbor, in the sense that many, if, uh, if not most, American companies are subject to FTC jurisdiction. And they will be subject to the FTC for any potential violations of Privacy Shield as well. Um, one addition, though, is that aggrieved parties can go directly now to the offending company, or at least allegedly offending company, for resolution, or they can go to their own data protection authority. So in that way, there is a bit of a difference between that and uh, Safe Harbor. Privacy Shield will not be challenged for at least a year. In fact, last month, EU data protection authorities collectively announced that they would withhold any legal challenges to Privacy Shield for at least a year, which is good news for companies that are certified. And I have no doubt that at the very least, uh, they will demand at the end of this year uh, changes based on how the certifying organization executed their data protection plans um, in practice. And given that data protection authorities were not thrilled with Privacy Shield as it was agreed on, I think you can expect some changes to Privacy Shield after the end of one year. It's just a question of what, how extensive they're going to be. Let me change gears and talk about personal data and how it's defined in Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield and the directive vis-a-vis -vis the GDPR. So uh, Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield both draw their definitions of personal data directly from the directive. And I'll, I'll point out a few aspects of this. Um, someone who is, if you go down to the, in fact, go down in the middle of the first paragraph, you can see where a, an identifiable person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly. And let's stop there, because this is important. If someone can be identified indirectly, it really begs the question of how, how attenuated can that, can that identification be. You'll find that you could use data that maybe is innocuous on its own, perhaps as GPS data, for example, that you can link with other data that can then identify someone. So directly or indirectly is really an important aspect of it. Uh, now if you go over to the regulation, so if you look to your right, go over the regulation, um, the definition is just about the same. However, it includes locations such as GPS or other geolocation data, which I just mentioned as an example, and online identifiers, which I'll speak about next. And as a practical matter, the definitions of personal data in the Data Protection Directive and on the regulation, very similar. Um, just just in for practice purposes of privacy professionals. 
And then let's go and talk about personal data and, and certainly where you can find it in your organization. I just referenced this idea of an online identifier. And you can think about how easy it is in the US. We think about personal data as a social security number or a medical record or a financial record or what have you. And uh, folks here are really surprised when I tell them that business contact information or an email address is considered personal data over in the EU. Well, we have this idea uh, in the GDPR of an online identifier. And so this is information that's produced by devices, applications, tools, and protocols. And you might say, well, gee, Scott, that could be just about anything. And you would be right. It can be just about anything. In essence, GDPR has expanded dramatically the scope of what's considered personal data. And when you link up that with the idea of it being applicable indirectly, you can see that you have a lot of opportunities to go search for personal data in your own enterprise. So some examples. Uh, GPS and geolocation data I just mentioned. IP addresses, including dynamic ones, which was kind of surprising. Um, MAC addresses, cookies, anything dealing with your mobile device. So mobile equipment IDs, identifiers, et cetera, et cetera. Advertising IDs to the extent they still are used. Log files, those of you who are administrators and you know how extensive log files can be if you have logging turned on, you'll find that there is a tremendous opportunity here to have personal data that you didn't know that you had before. Okay, so personal data defined. Um, both Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield draw their definitions of personal data from the directive. And I'm just going to point a couple aspects of this. In fact, if you can go into the middle of that, if you look to the middle of that uh, first big paragraph where it talks about identifiable person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, let's, let's stop there. The fact that you can identify someone indirectly really opens up opportunities for all kinds of data that may be innocuous in and of itself but could be linked with other data to directly identify someone. That really opens up the universe of data that is potentially um, uh, relevant for our discussion here. Now, if you go over to the GDPR definition, you can see it is almost identical. The only thing uh, they add are location data, so GPS data, for example, or so-called online identifiers. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, just in summary, as a practical matter, the definitions are very similar. Um, across these two regimes. Okay. What's important here also is that both of those definitions, uh, they, they exceed the our domestic version of, of what that looks like. Um, pretty much most states, most states have uh, some some definition with regards to what constitutes personally identifiable information, and both of these are broader in scope than those are. So let's go ahead and jump into to, to what some of that mm -hmm. looks like. Yeah, that's a great point, Gabe, by the way. Um, so personal data, it is almost everywhere. And uh, just the definition of, of personal data, think of it as something that's very expansive. I mean, from a US perspective, it's easy to think that personal data is just medical records or financial records or social security numbers. And pretty much everyone I speak with is surprised that things like email or business contact information is considered personal data in the EU. Um, in addition, not surprisingly, things like cookies um, well, for browsers and then static IP addresses also considered personal data. Under the regulation, though, you have what are called online identifiers. And these are things that are produced by devices, applications, tools, and protocols. And at this point, you might be saying, gee, Scott, that could be just about anything. And you would be right. It could be just about anything. It could be GPS data, IP addresses of all sorts, MAC addresses, cookies, anything dealing with mobile devices, advertising IDs, and then, of course, my favorite, log files. Uh, log files, there's all kinds of devices that log. And yes, that is all potentially uh, data that can indirectly identify someone. So the net net of all this is that you're likely to have a lot more potentially personal data in your enterprise than you first realize. We have a question that came in. It's pretty good. Too. Someone asked, is there a distinction for data that is already publicly available or business related? So if, for example, my email address is readily publicly available because I post on a forum and my name's attached to it, does that still mm -hmm. constitute information that requires the same level of protection if I'm the one processing it? If you've, if you've released it publicly, essentially you're giving consent uh, for that piece of data to be used, you can make the argument, um, and certainly that's what I would do, is if someone's publishing it, say, on, on 
a slide like this, for example, my contact information. Where you run into trouble is if there's information that's not publicly available that uh, that people are using to connect with that that publicly available information, and then um, dig more uh, into your records or into finding more about you than would be normally available. Then you can make the argument that uh, that's not legitimate. So this is a slippery slope here, but just using that publicly available information and nothing else, you can make a great argument that uh, they, that person's implicitly giving consent. Yeah, I might be inclined to err on the side of, of treating any data that I collect or process um, as not, if only because sorting through it all and attempting to identify which ones are or aren't and updating a database with that type of information um, is certainly going to add to to you know an already heavy workflow with regards to this activity. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay. Let's um, we'll talk about. I just want to talk about special and sensitive personal data because this is a distinct uh, concept that we don't have here to speak of in the U.S. Um, so what are the implications um, for special, uh, special sensitive personal data? Um, first off, I'll just read a couple of these, these points here. Um, medical or health uh, data, racial or ethnic, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, um, or sex life related. So again, this is a special class of data. If you want to process this, then you have to get explicit permission from the data subject. Concept just doesn't exist here to speak of in the US. And the GDPR? uses almost the same exact thing. So uh, they're fairly well consistent um, among, uh, among the two of them. Notice that in the GDPR, however, you also have genetic and biometric data, which is not surprising because they've updated the definition. What's interesting is if you think about how many um, buildings have access control nowadays or network access control that relies on a fingerprint or a retina scan or what have you, Potentially, all of that now is personal data or special personal data, which means you're going to have to find um, some way to get the okay to use that, uh, even if it's for limited access to the building or to the network or what have you. So, um, just a good example of the implications of personal data. Um, Gabe, any thoughts before we go to the next one? Just one. I don't know if I'm going off track, though, but it occurs to me that the other reason why all of all of this data, that is, knowing where it is and, and processing it and tracking it becomes important is with their rights to be forgotten. Um, that would include pretty much any and all special and sensitive personal data, too, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And you're going to have to have a mechanism to be able to eliminate that uh, on request. And then, which begs the question, how are you going to find it, which um, certainly we'll answer later on in the, in the presentation. But yes, absolutely, the uh, right to be forgotten is a big issue that uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't specifically cover in this presentation. But uh, yes, sir, you're spot on. Yeah, that, 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 that certainly does seem to be yet another driver for this. All right, let's keep this train going. OK. Let's talk about security standards then. Um, so definition of, of security under the, uh, the directive and therefore under Privacy Shield uh, is, is what you're seeing there on the screen where it talks about reasonable and appropriate measures to protect personal data from loss, misuse, unauthorized access, disclosure, alteration, and destruction. Now, if you take a, a short walk over to the regulation, you're going to see that it is asking data controllers and actually data processors as well to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures. It also is asking to protect the confidentiality, in integrity, availability, and resilience. So the first three legs uh, of the CAI triad and resilience um, of processing systems. So um, I guess it begs the question here, are these the same standards more or less? And I think you can make the argument that they are. Um, with the exception of resilience, which is in the GDPR, essentially this is saying the same thing, that it's got to be risk-based, it's got to be reasonable and appropriate, and they have to be measures, which I translate for me to control, um, to protect confidentiality, or access, integrity, availability, et cetera. So really, the only difference is that GDPR requires resilience, meaning some kind of active redundancy, um, not just a, a, a cold backup and cold storage somewhere. So as a practical matter, I think that you can make a great argument that essentially this is the same standard, which is great news, because uh, as I'll mention later, you can use the Privacy Shield uh, compliance as an on-ramp for GDPR compliance.
I have a question, and, and then uh, yeah. a participant also has a question as well, too. So have you seen or is there any movement to to borrow and or start modeling some of our, our either state or, or federal laws um, to look similar to this? I mean, we, we know California tends to lead the way in this, in, in this uh, arena, and, and being a California resident yourself, is there something similar kind of coming that way or to the rest of the U.S.? Unfortunately, I wish I could say it was. Um, we're, we're at a point now where we really, as a nation, need to make a decision whether we want to, to go to a, a comprehensive instead of a sectoral system and to be more or less on parity with uh, how they do things in the EU. Um, I just don't see a political will right now because it's going to require a huge amount of effort to get us up to that standard. So right. well, essentially what, what's happening is that as individual organizations, we're, we're saying we're going to adhere to that standard as individual organizations, but as a nation, we haven't gotten there. And so I'm hoping that this will be a, an on-ramp as well to getting us as a nation um, on parity with the EU. But I don't see that uh, from a legislative standpoint anytime soon. Interesting. All right. That, that certainly does... Um that, that kind of bodes with a lot of what I've seen. I was curious if, if, if you saw other changes on the horizon. Um, again, I, I, I'm inclined to, to take the highest path, the highest route to that, so that you can kind of future-proof any such regulation uh, coming, coming down. So here's, here's another question, and a really good one too. So can you, can you get a little bit more granular on the difference between availability and resilience in GDPR. I think what the, the, the participant is asking is, you know, because in, in security in general, there's a concept of availability which really speaks directly to ensuring that data is accessible versus mm -hmm. resilience. Yeah, I, you know, I thought the same thing when I read that, that really isn't resilience a species of accessibility, and I, I think it is. I'm, I'm curious why, and I, I've done a fair amount of research and can't find the answer, but I was curious why they specifically broke out resilience, because really we're talking about redundancy, and perhaps it's an adaptive redundancy like TCPIP essentially gives us. Um, I, I've, I've been curious about that. I haven't found a good answer, so um, I, I don't at this point, can't really offer any much advice in that in that department. But it is an interesting question. You know what? I I think uh, I think maybe we do a little bit more digging. Maybe reach out to some some of our other contacts and see if we can get get a, a definitive answer. Because like, that is a really good question. And even I look mm -hmm. at that as a practitioner, and and it feels a little redundant to me. But mm -hmm. I suspect that there is a, a very clear distinction between the two. All right, so here's a really mm -hmm. interesting question, right? Um, so sure. if someone was born in the United States, but they have an EU passport, if they were to move back to the EU, could they request that the that U.S. companies that have their data treat them um, like an EU citizen? Oh, boy. Um, if Boy, that's a, that's a great question. Um, boy, uh, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the somewhat longer uh, answer is that if they uh, gave their data as a U.S. citizen or even as a U.S. resident uh, uh, to, to companies in the U.S., I think you can make an argument that under that rubric that uh, they wouldn't have a right to be forgotten um, once they moved back over to the U.S. for that, that previously given data. It would only be for, for um, new data. Now, you can make the argument completely differently and say that, well, once a GDPR applies, if it applies to that company at all, it applies to that person's um, data as well. So the short answer is I don't know, but you can make arguments either way. Interesting. Excellent. All right, let's keep moving. Okay. So uh, finding personal data. Um, how do you find personal data in your information uh, ecosystem? So with respect to finding personal data, um, I'd like to share with you all the idea of data discovery, which in my view is the process of locating specific types of data in your enterprise ecosystem um, in order to adequately protect or remove them. And I use the word specific as opposed to sensitive because you could be looking for anything, um, although I imagine you're probably going to prioritize highly regulated data and sensitive data um, just because, just as a practical matter. Um, and certainly some of the targets that you'd be uh, having on your list, uh, email servers, probably at the top, file shares, SharePoint, always a good one, cloud everything, as I call it, so Box, Dropbox, etc. Anything that could be considered an endpoint, like mobile devices, and then what I like to call loose files, 
uh, any of you are in the e-discovery business, you've, you're well versed with loose files floating around on your network. I do want to compare data discovery to e-discovery. Uh, data discovery is not e-discovery. Um, data discovery searches, uh, essentially they look at data as it exists at that moment in your information ecosystem. They do not create an index, an inverted word index, sometimes we'll call it, like e-discovery software does. Um, also, it's not the same thing as file classification. File classification is a information governance tool. So that will analyze metadata that you have of your information in your ecosystem. And then it will tell you that the marketing department has way too many PowerPoints or finance um, has so many uh, Excel files or what have you. So uh, it's an it's a information governance tool that really wasn't designed for, uh, for finding personal data. And then um, rolling into data discovery in action. Um, no doubt that many of you in the call have used regex or Boolean searches to locate data in your enterprise as part of a forensic process. And the limitation of these tools is that they lack precision and they generate a lot of false positives. And Gabe, I know you're an expert with this, so I'm going to turn this over to you and you can uh, speak a little bit more about this. Yeah, for sure. Let's do that. So. To your point about regex and Boolean not being enough, so why is that? Let's take the example of locating credit card numbers. Relatively straightforward, pretty basic on the face of it, right? So if you're just going to use pattern matching, you are going to hit on any string that matches a, a pattern with a format of four digits, four digits, four digits, four digits, right? So in principle, you could plug all of that information and you could plug all those results into the Loon algorithm, which was which is used to validate credit card numbers. Um, and you can see if it returns a valid match. Um, you, you very well might, but you, you, you certainly could return just test card data as well too, um, which ultimately provides additional tedious steps that, that you have to, to re remove and so on. The example that I have on the screen is one that we like to call, you know, kind of the sea of digits problem, which is we see lots of, of numbers that match a pure string uh, search, a pure regex search all the time in locations where it's obvious that they they should not be identified as a credit card number or, or some other or some other type of data type that we were looking to locate using using simply pattern matching. Um, and as a practical matter, that kind of searching simply doesn't scale, right? Um, so one of the ways to further identify and verify and validate the types of data that you're looking for, especially the the, the ones that, that Todd laid out earlier as part of the GDPR, um, when you start looking for things like MAC addresses and, and, uh, and, and EME numbers, you know, just strings of numbers that otherwise can and will match on lots of other other types of data in your environment. Um, you're going to, you're going to encounter lots of false positives and and to to an equal measure lots of false negatives too. So there there needs to be validation checks, right? So when I see a credit card number, for example, um, is there an expiration date near it? Is there a CVV near it? Um, what's on either side of that number? Uh, are those digits unique and so on? So there's a number of things that go into to identifying um, with with a certain level of accuracy what data types are. So let's talk about the role classification plays in that. Um, so we've spoken a bit about data discovery, right? So lo let's kind of switch gears up here and go into this. So if I were to just kind of verbatim give you the, the somewhat academic definition of classification, it would be the process of analyzing a document or record and applying a label that indicates who can access it, how it should be protected, how long it should be retained, and how it should be disposed of. Think of that as an overlay of, of both governance processes and security processes over your already existing information lifecycle management processes, right? So things that you very well may already be doing. You may already have some concept of, of document retention and, and what types of documents need, need to be retained and so on. Um, so the role of classification is to further inform all of, of these these different uh, activities. So, the most important thing to to note as as part of the 
the importance and role of classification, that is it has to be repeatable. Has to be repeatable, has to be defensible. The process has been giving a maturity level such that it can be repeated consistently, much like any other process in your organization uh, relies on. It also has to be defensible so far as in you have to be able to demonstrate that the approach you use was appropriate for the level of risk involved. Dave, let me jump in there if I can yeah, just for just a moment. Um, I want to just, just really underscore this idea that, um, that, one, this is a process. And I say it's a process because let's say that you have a parent regulation, and I'll use the ITAR because I'm from the, working from the defense industry. Um, there's going to be a, a policy that's going to be generated uh, as a consequence of that, of that regulation. There's probably many policies. And that policy is going to be chock full of what we call expectations. So uh, you can call them control objectives or expectations. It's the list of stuff you've got to do. And then you're going to have the control themselves to enforce the fact that you've got to do those things. Um, the, these three, the policies, expectations, controls, all these have to be developed over time. And they constantly have to be updated because the regulations are constantly updated. So you've got to uh, move with them and adapt to them as they change. And then to your point on having to be defensible and repeatable, a lot of that is driven by the idea that you're going to wind up in court or before a tribunal at some point where you're going to have to defend what you did. Um, and I emphasized this a lot when I was in the discovery business. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be appropriate to the risk in question. So if you can demonstrate that you consistently classified information according to how risk sensitive it is and the potential damage that would happen if that escaped, and you've done all the things that are reasonable under the circumstances, then you can make a very good case that even though something bad happened, you still are protected and you're not liable. Um, and certainly if there's any residual liability, that may be covered by insurance, but the net net of it is that you've done what you uh, are expected to do under the law. And I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that. That's a great point. I want to I want to piggyback on that and highlight two things. The first is uh, your big air quotes comment at the top of this webinar, which was adequacy, right? And that plays directly into whether or not you were doing enough to actually protect the data. Um, the FTC's language is actually almost pretty similar to that, which. Is, it sounds vague, but, but it ultimately states that you have to have a reasonable amount of, of controls in place for this. It's the other reason why accuracy becomes so important, because making the argument that simply doing a regex search was enough, even though you know you're returning lots of invalid data, um, certainly won't hold weight. All right, so let's talk about why data classification. Scott, you want to run with this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, oh, by the way, before we leave, I have to. I have to say, there's always a lawyer. This is uh, this is actually <laughs> our former, our former CISO at a former company of mine, uh, uh, whom I used to work with every day. Uh, always like to say, there's always a lawyer because every time a question came up, uh, he had to call me uh, because the question was, well, great. Well, what's the legal standard under which we operate? Uh, if I do X, will that make me compliant? Uh, is the policy correct? Would you read this? I mean, he at, at some point he just started saying there's always a lawyer because you have to very uh, be tightly coupled, you as an attorney or a privacy professional, with your information security folks. And uh, that, I think, model is going to be the, not just present. I think it's going to be entirely the future as well. You know, I think that's that that's a statement that, that everyone should adopt. And, you know, w with regards to... Uh, to, to data protection in, in general, there is mm -hmm. always a lawyer. If, if you thought auditors were bad, um, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Okay. Picture, picture an auditor with with an Esquire title, if you. Will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Except, so, except the present company, of course. Yeah, of course. Of course, I know you always qualify that. Thank you. Um, so, why data classification? As we alluded to earlier, um, it answers questions like, what do you have? Where is it? Who has access to it? How is it controlled? How is it retained and disposed of? And these are questions that if you're not asking now, they will likely be asked of you in a court or other tribunal down the road. So, the benefit of data classification, again, we mentioned earlier about creating consistency. Um, it creates consistency. And, and let me just ask you all this. How many times have you seen a document that says proprietary and confidential? Another one says personal and confidential. Um, uh, is that the same thing? It's just confidential. Um, and suppose it's not marked, but it's obviously confidential. Then what? Or 
expose it to market attorney client privilege. Is that the same thing as confidential? Is that higher? Um, I don't know. And frankly, a lot of people uh, you would ask wouldn't know either. So by having data classification, you create that consistency. You say, yes, this is class four, ergo, it requires these controls. It just makes it a lot easier. Um, next up, um, data classification enables you to justify and prior prioritize your controls. So they say that you have a favorite control, and I think um, many of you InfoSec folks all have favorite controls that you, you want to employ. And you, you've got uh, designs on buying that that control, whatever it might be, and there's a long list of them. Um, and so the question is, how do you prioritize? Well, you go to your most sensitive data, your class four or whatever your highest level is, and you say, okay, uh, we believe that the control set should be this. Uh, we're going to need um, uh, deep packet inspection. We're going to need encryption. We're going to need tokenization. We're going to need this, 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 this. And here's our justification because the law says we need it. Therefore, Mr. CFO, give me the money to do it. I mean, this is not to be too cynical, but this is how the process works. And so it enables you to prioritize uh, your controls based on regulatory requirements. I want to add a bit more to that because increasingly I'm seeing um, a lot more folks use data classification for the purpose of informing um, a lot of other, uh, as you, you highlight, controls. So everything from, from further informing their, their threat intelligence information, right? So I have active events against this target. Um, however, what what does the data class? What does the, the data classified on, on those endpoints or, or in that server or in that cloud also tell me? Is it genuinely something that needs to be prioritized as a response now or later? And the answer to that is, if in this example, for example, you know, I, I see documents that are marked as public C1 um, crossing the wire in, in large amounts. I may not necessarily decide to chase that down immediately. Um, we see the same thing uh, increasingly occurring on at the opposite end of the spectrum, whereby there's an incident, and the first question that gets asked is, okay, well, what was compromised, if anything at all? Well, with DC in place, with data classification in place, that question gets easily answered, right? All right, so there was an incident in that machine, maybe there was a bit of malware, maybe we've got some ransomware, but looking at everything that we know about the data that was, that was impacted, um, it very well could be something or it could be nothing. Um, I have seen in the last 30 days that very example playing out live whereby the information that was ransomed turned out to be nothing of, of a high classification importance and so they pretty much decided no, we're not paying that ransom and moved right along. Wow, that's a great story. Um, I'll just share with the audience before we go to the next slide that uh, I was involved some multinational investigations on uh, some potential escapes of, uh, of unclassified controlled uh, information. And had uh, data classification been in place at that time, it would have made things infinitely easier. Because for highly regulated industries uh, like defense, and I, and I imagine financial and also healthcare, um, having what we call an escape or loss of data is going to precipitate some kind of a report at the very minimum and a disclosure. And certainly being able to say definitively, yes, no class 4 or class X, whatever class is in question, data was, uh, was compromised, it's going to make your life infinitely easier, especially if you've got a report that you can put and append to that report and say, yes, um, only this certain data was uh, was compromised. So, so yeah, yeah, just to underscore your point. Uh, uh, Yet another good example. Yet another great example because there are thresholds to to uh, to reporting. I, I know for a fact that HIPAA specifically has has uh, thresholds in place as well too, right? Where there it doesn't become reportable unless it's over X number of records. I don't want to quote that number, but I want to say it's like in the 300 range. Um, but yeah, mm. all the more reason why further informing. Um, all, all of your security operations activities uh, and then your overall data protection activities becomes important with this process. All right, great. Excellent, excellent. Let's talk about data classification components. There's four components, at least in my view, uh, to data classification. And, and the first is a matrix. So it's a, it's a tool that allows you to cross-reference a category of data, which we'll see in a minute, with a type of controls required. Um, and then secondly, the matrix is embedded in a data classification handling and storage policy, which if you don't have, we'll be creating if you have a data classification matrix. And what's important about having a policy like this is it covers uh, 
not just the matrix, it cover or even handling and so on and so forth. It covers things like putting together a steering committee, getting an executive sponsor, getting a subcommittee for standards, such as for encryption standards and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the net net of it is that you really have to have this, this policy uh, that also um, uh, subjects people to punishment if they're not following it. Uh, thirdly is tools themselves. So this is data classification uh, and discovery tools that um, we'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, it also includes um, out, what I call allied tools, so data loss prevention. It includes scripts, perhaps, that you're going to have run automatically if a certain event happens. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do with data classification and, and, uh, and discovery tools um, that will really assist in, uh, in remediating or preventing uh, loss of personal data. And then finally, there is monitoring and audit. And so think about the same processes that you would use for SOCs or ISO 27K or COVID or what have you. Uh, the same kind of processes for, uh, for that would also apply uh, in an analogous form to uh, data classification and discovery processes. So same thing and probably the same auditors. What you're seeing here is an actual data classification matrix that I worked on for a previous client. They were very gracious in allowing me to use a version of that one for, for this presentation. So you're seeing the real thing here. And you can see the different classes of, of information. And what's important is that the different classes of information are a function of how much damage is going to happen um, if that information gets out. So if you look at class four, what I call generically is really the, the most uh, dangerous, the most sensitive stuff, um, disclosure is going to likely result in significant adverse impact to the company. So as a consequence, uh, if something is tagged as a class four item, for example, then no transmission via fax. Um, you have to restrict access to certain people. You can't just broadcast it, um, include appropriate notices, and so on and so forth. So uh, the most important thing to think about here is that this, this matrix really is forcing you to make some hard decisions. Because if you have the business class four, are you going to be willing to enforce the fact that you can't fax it now? or you're going to do some variation of that. Maybe you'll force you to have people either, either into the fax machine or fax to two locked rooms or what have you. But the question is, politically, can people uh, uh, deal with all of these restrictions? So you can see that this really forces you to ask a lot of hard questions. And certainly we did when I was part of that committee. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's also controls for specific media. So if we drop down, if you look to say electronic file transfer um, for class three and class Class four items, you can't do electronic file transfer, like say uh, FTP, for example, for these items, unless it's encrypted using an approved message by the Data Classification Committee. So again, this taking every single medium and going through it and saying what controls are we going to put on it really forces a lot of uh, hard questions and discussion, and again, some happy unhappy discussion sometimes about what people are willing to tolerate in terms of controls. But this is why a data classification matrix is so, is so necessary. I think the other reason why this is really important um, from my experience is it really helps, as you mentioned in, in, in uh, slide two slides previously, to, to build your actual policy. Sitting down to derive that policy prior to having outlined what your data types are, their impact, the sensitivity, et cetera, um, more often than not tends to leave something uncovered. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, that Todd, Todd, I apologize, that Scott has has helped and assisted in, in, in producing an impact calculus that essentially takes these data types, takes into consideration your data types, your 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 loss, your loss calculations, your threshold for risk, and pretty much outputs something that looks like very similar to this, which is a matrix that informs you as to what the handling policies um, will look like. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Um, I know that um, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, um, so uh, certainly if there are questions, you can feel free to send them in. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about why classification is critical. Um, uh, and this was, uh, a, I've seen a lot of scary statistics, but even this one surprised me. 90% of breaches are not discovered for at least the first three months. So you think about all the kind of damage that can be done as a consequence and not knowing uh, that you've been breached, uh, not knowing the information, where it is, where you have to check, it's going to make your life miserable. And uh, certainly uh, this example here of, uh, of then-Governor Bush 
sending out uh, emails that are, uh, I guess, object linked and embedded OLED uh, with uh, social security information. Um, this was something that happened, I think, back in 2003, but I believe it happened again recently when he uh, published everything uh, before the campaign or during the campaign. And exactly. tell me if I'm wrong about that, Gabe. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was. It was it was yeah. during the uh, the early stages of the primaries. Um, one of one of the aides had put together this presentation, um, and, and on the face of it, the presentation had exactly what you're looking at, right? So it had it had this graph and it had these numbers and so on, but it was being derived from a spreadsheet that was embedded. It's exactly what it was an OLED spreadsheet. So if you were to just flip through this the slide deck, you would not have seen that. If you were to double click into that graph in particular, it would have exposed. It did expose. Uh, the, the spreadsheet where it came from, which had the, the personal information of all of his constituents, um, home addresses, uh, social security numbers, phone numbers, emails. It had a lot of private data. Um, we've, we've further seen m more similar type incidents since then, um, but this is one of those, the, those very common scenarios where your basic mishandling of, of information occurs because one person creates something, whether it's a document like this or they run a report from from a, a, a central repository, you know, whether it's Salesforce, whatever the case may be, your HR database, that information gets shared, manipulated, or otherwise tr transmitted um, because on the surface of it, someone just simply by looking at it did not know that. So even after you've gone through the exit of creating that matrix, creating those policies, informing your, your or your employees as to handling policies and so on. This is why this is why Scott mentioned that the third part of that being being able to operationalize the, those policies now. So how do you in effect ensure that those those policies are are being adhered to without going around and slapping everyone on the hand over and over again? Um, and to answer the question, will the slides be available? Yes, yes, it will. We'll we'll be sending those. Absolutely. By the way, I gave an interesting point here too. Is not just uh, I mean, on this point, 95% of breaches not covered. I think is, is, is very important. Also, I have found that in a, in a plurality, if not a majority of cases, the data that was taken was data that the the uh, victim didn't even know was on their own network. So I mean, that's what's really fascinating is that they were finding out through the the news media of what they had on their own network, and uh, that kind of of scenario is a lot less likely to happen when you've got data discovery and classification because you've already found it, you've already tagged it. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So let me um, offer some conclusions and recommend uh, recommendations and if we have more, more uh, uh, questions, we'll definitely address those as well. I think we do. Um, GDPR applies globally. So if you are any company and you are selling goods or services into the EU, uh, this this law is going to apply to you, and um, I I've found a lot of folks that don't realize that that they have operations or just are just marketing into the EU, and they are subject to it. And they don't realize they think it's EU only, and and under no circumstances is that the case. Um, secondly, Privacy Shield can be your GDPR on ramp because the security aspect of it is very similar. Uh, you can certainly make an argument for that, that using Privacy Shield as a means to talk to uh, the security folks and more importantly the finance folks in your company and saying, hey, this is the time we need uh, to start getting ready for GDPR, you can use Privacy Shield as an on-ramp, as it were, to get the conversation started. Um, thirdly, and I alluded to this before, is data classification is as much a political process of a technical one. So there's going to be people that, that do not want to follow data classification because it's going to create controls and that's going to slow things down. And in a lot of cases, there's a lot of emails that should be slowed down and just frankly shouldn't be sent. And so data classification will result in that. So it, it's inherently political. It's not just a, 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 a technology that you buy or a button you push. Um, I, want to, more, I want to interrupt oh, there. That, that's why it becomes so important to, to again, create the matrix in the policy because if you apply the if you apply the same level of control across everything, you will in, you will encounter that friction, that uh, that friction to adoption. Just as Scott points out, that that political uh, issue, if you would, if you were to apply controls as necessary based on the severity or lack thereof, you then reduce the amount of friction in in overall adoption and workflow. Excellent. Um, on the to do list, 
um, that you'll need if you're going to put together a data classification and uh, discovery program. You're going to need an exe executive sponsor. As I, as I cited earlier, executive sponsorship is so critical because if someone does, cannot move the ball down the field and cannot get uh, the CFO and the other uh, folks to agree, this isn't going to go anywhere. So you're going to need an executive sponsor. You're going to need at least one steering committee, likely a subcommittee, to address the specifics of the matrix and the policies. And if you're likely going to be in a multinational environment, you're going to want to have your folks overseas in the EU on board on this. Because if you try and do this without them, it's going to fail. I can tell you that. And everything takes a lot longer when you work with folks overseas. There's just that time lag. It's just going to take a lot longer. So you're going to have to put some more runway in um, for those folks. And there will be a um, And the yes, and there, there better be a lawyer, or two or three. <laughs> <laughs> the, the upside of this is that because you're putting more thought and energy up front into this, um, you're really multiplying the benefits you have across the enterprise. And you think about all of the regulations that your organization has anyway for protecting data in general, it's not just personal data. It can be confidential data that a third party is giving you or your own trade secrets or attorney-client privilege materials. All of this gets captured under that same regime. So it's not just personal data. It's really a lot of other things. And you're, so you're multiplying those benefits. And um, finally, uh, from my perspective anyway, uh, data discovery classification, probably the most cost-effective tool for promoting information security and data privacy you have right now, simply because it's, it's really almost an administrative tool, not just a technical one that gives you the ability to not just find data, but also administratively say, OK, this belongs in this class, and therefore it's going to get these controls. It just really gives you a lot more bang for the buck, just because you're, you're not just putting in a piece of equipment. You're really um, taking a look at how you move data and protect data around your entire um, information ecosystem. Great. So with the last couple of minutes left, I want to open the floor up to questions. A couple of them have been coming in. So if folks have questions, now would be the time before we hit the hour. Um, and if we, we happen to go over, that's fine also. Um, and or feel free to email those questions in. So the first one I have, Scott, is uh, so when mm -hmm. is a third party considered a processor? Oh, boy, this is, this is a great question. And I've had several arguments about this uh, with, with um, processors in the past. Uh, generally speaking, I use the but for test that if, if it wasn't but for your relationship with them, they wouldn't have the personal data of your, your customers or your employees, then they're a processor. Now, some of them have disagreed with me on several occasions, but I still believe that to be the best test. That's a good, good. Good question, great response. And if I recall as well, too, um, just to be clear, so third-party processors are equally responsible for that protection, yes? Yes, they are, under the GDPR and essentially under the privacy shield because you're having to hold them to the same standards that you're held to as well. So effectively, both privacy shield and GDPR require third parties to, to use the same um, standards that you do. Great. Another question that came in, so what's the effect of Brexit on GDPR and Privacy Shield? Um, at this point, I don't think it's going to be much of one because we still have a lot of runway to go before Brexit takes place. And I'm sure that they'll put together um, some kind of plan for addressing data privacy um, as part of that, of that Brexit plan. Um, and it may well be that, that uh, the UK simply subscribes to the uh, GDPR anyway as a standard that it'll use or it can create its own. So I don't expect it to be any any impact whatsoever, in my view, anyway. I can't imagine that even if there were to be some different regulation under the UK, that it would be anything less than GDPR. That that would have to be the bar, in my opinion. Um, but mm -hmm. to your point, there's a lot of runway before anything there even happens. And there's a lot of speculation that ultimately um, everything is going to look the same way it does now <laughs> in, in the end. Yeah. Um, all right, another sure. great question came in. So what about cloud service providers? Are they treated any differently under GDPR or Privacy Shield? Nope. If they're a processor, they have to play by the same rules that, that controllers do. So the fact that they're a cloud provider doesn't really change that dynamic at all. And that's what I like about the GDPR and, and to a lesser degree about Privacy Shield is essentially saying that controllers and processors held the same standards. And so if you're a controller, you're passing on those standards to the, uh, to the processor, whether they're a cloud or anything else. All right, great. 
Well, it looks like we have hit the hour here. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, if there are any more questions, by all means, go ahead and fire them in now. Um, otherwise, feel free to reach out to us. Um, there's Scott's email address on the screen, so feel free to contact him with, uh, with questions as well. Um, you can find us online at www.spirian.com or on Twitter at Spirian, um, as well as myself. Uh, there, my email address is also in the slides there, and you can find me online as well at Gabriel Gums. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Scott, I want to thank you so much for, for spending some time with us today and, uh, and, and sharing your knowledge on the topic and answering these important questions. Fabulous. Thank you for having me on board, Gab. All right. Thanks, everyone. And until next time, we'll talk. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye-bye.